Hey there, everybody. Just because current conditions are such that we can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center doesn't mean we can't go outside and look up at the real sky ourselves. This short presentation will help guide you to find several bright stars, constellations, and planets in the month of October. Since September 22nd, we have officially moved into the fall equinox season of constellations, which can now begin to be seen at around 8 p.m., and it's these I'll be pointing out. By the way, if this is your first time here, yes, the constellations have seasons. For example, you'll never see Gemini the Twins during the fall, and likewise you'll never see Cygnus the Swan during the spring. We'll meet Cygnus a little later. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's yearly orbital path around the Sun. That, and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night, which changes our view of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully, but most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass using a star grouping that is quite easy to find, Cassiopeia, the Queen, also known as the Big W. Face the sky roughly 90 degrees to the right of where the sun had set and look about halfway up from the horizon to the top of the sky and you'll see it. As you can see, Cassiopeia has five stars that make up the W shape, which is actually her throne. From this angle, it's upside down. This sixth star makes up the seat of the throne, which can be seen to have a rather unergonomic back. Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W, you might see another somewhat faint seventh star. Just connect the end of the W to that star and extend the line until it comes to the semi-bright star, which is named Polaris and is otherwise known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is. So no matter what time of the night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is of course an illusion caused by the Earth's spin, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact it is the Earth that's moving. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's north pole straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of its bowl are called the Guardians because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Here is Draco the Dragon with his squarish head, long neck, two short legs and feet, and long tail which arcs gracefully over the Little Dipper. Just between Draco and Cassiopeia we find our next constellation, Cepheus the King, and yes, he is Cassiopeia's husband. At this time of night, he's upside down, but he's got a triangular crown, a squarish head with a pigtail at the base of his head, and he's smiling, cause he's the king. I like finding him by using the non-squashed end of Cassiopeia, which points directly into his face. To find our next constellation, let's first look at the asterism known as the Great Square. By the way, an asterism is not a constellation, but merely a familiar star grouping. The brightest star of the square is the head of Andromeda, the Chained Lady. She's got one star as her head, a torso, and one arm pointing out away from her body with a couple of chains attached. The other foreshortened arm is curled down below, and she has one straight leg, while the other leg is up and bent at the knee. If your sky is dark enough, you might see a dim fuzzy spot just off her knee. Binoculars would make it plain to see in even somewhat light-polluted skies. 
That's the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest neighboring spiral galaxy at 2.5 million light years from us, which makes it the furthest object that can be seen with the naked eye. It's on a collision course with our own Milky Way galaxy, but worry not. The collision won't happen for another 5 billion years, give or take a few hundred million. To continue, let's turn our view to the south, like so. This will flip everything we've seen to the north upside down and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. The other three stars of the Great Square make up the wing of our next constellation, Pegasus, the winged horse. His wing attaches to the rear end of his body, and he's got four legs, neck, and long, horsey nose. To the right of Pegasus is Cygnus the Swan, who I first mentioned near the beginning of this presentation. It's got a pair of large, sweeping wings, a long neck, and nose. Its brightest star is called Deneb. To the right of Cygnus, we find Lyra the Lyre, a small Greek harp, and not a person who tells untruths. Its brightest star is the seventh brightest star in the night sky, Vega. Just below Cygnus and Lyra, we have the constellation Aquila, the eagle. He's a bit faint, but has a head with a beak and its bright eye, Altair, two swept forward wings, a body, and tail. The three bright stars, Vega, Altair, and Deneb, make up our next asterism, which we call the Summer Triangle. You'll recall I mentioned asterisms before with the Great Square. Though it's called the Summer Triangle, we'll be seeing this familiar star grouping through the remainder of fall before losing it to the daylight of the sun. To the right of Lyra, we find our next constellation, Hercules, the strong man. That square is the asterism called the Keystone, and from there you might be able to make out the rest of him, a man running along whilst brandishing a large club. Somewhat low above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic, and is also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology, most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work, we are in their debt. Our first zodiacal constellation is Sagittarius the Archer, just getting ready to set in the southwest with his triangular head, body, feet, and left hand holding out his bow while his right hand is held aloft as though he just loosed an arrow. A lot of Sagittarius is too faint to be fully seen, especially being so close to the southwest horizon, but he's got yet another asterism that consists of the brighter parts of him and are easy to find called the teapot. So, unless you're at a good dark sky site, look for the teapot, and you'll have found a good portion of Sagittarius. Just to the left of Sagittarius are two bright, quote-unquote, stars, which aren't stars at all, but rather the planet Saturn on the left and Jupiter on the right. If you get a chance, take a look at them through as big a telescope as you can. They are both rather spectacular. Just to the left of Saturn and Jupiter is our next zodiacal constellation, Capricornus, the goat. At first glance, he looks like a child's top or an upside-down pyramid, but as you can see, he's got a horn on his head, a body with legs, and a small tail. Our next constellation is Aquarius, the water bearer, though unless you're at a really good dark sky site, I'd skip trying to find him, as he is quite faint. As you can see, he looks like a man holding a vessel of water that's spilling as he runs along. Our last zodiacal constellation, and the last constellation of the night, is Pisces the Fishes. Pisces is pretty faint, and you'd have to have a pretty dark sky to see it. But I had to mention it because it contains a planet we haven't seen since June of 2019. More than a year. Mars. Mars will appear as a fairly bright, somewhat reddish-colored star rising above the eastern horizon, and fortuitously will still be close to opposition, meaning Earth and Mars will be as close together as their orbits allow for this year. This gives our best views of the planet when looking through Earth-bound telescopes, which I again fully recommend. Two other things. First, this month we have a full moon on Halloween, and it's a blue moon. It won't actually be blue, but it will be the second full moon within the same month. An October full moon is called a hunter's moon, so officially, 
This Halloween's full moon should be called a blue hunter's moon, or a hunter's blue moon, or thereabouts. Second, the Orionid meteor shower is happening right now. It peaks on October 20th and 21st, and it will display perhaps as many as 20 meteors per hour, with a few bright fireballs every now and then, seen from a good dark sky. No equipment is needed other than an adjustable lawn recliner and maybe a sleeping bag. Point your feet to the south and just watch as much of the sky as possible. The meteors will appear to originate from the constellation Orion the Hunter, but will be visible over the entire sky. The best time to view most meteor showers is around 2 a.m., and by that time, the waxing crescent moon will have already set, so the sky should be nice and dark perfect for searching out faint meteors. And that's it. There are other smaller or fainter constellations out there which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them by the author H. A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts are drawn. The astro-scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for convenience, they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $12. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars that are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned. There are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us all very happy. And we'll see you in the future.